first of all, uh, thank you for having me this evening. Thank you for coming out. Uh, it's always great to have the opportunity to talk about our work. Uh, we spend countless hours, uh, as you might imagine, and all the architects in the room know. And it's so great to be able to have the opportunity to share common our thoughts and thinking with you. Uh, my name is Michael Sorensen. I'm a partner and design director at Henning Larsen. I've been at the firm since 2016, uh, 2006, sorry. Uh, four years ago, I moved to uh, New York and started the New York office. We are currently 50 people in our New York office, and we do work uh, from Toronto to Raleigh to from New York to uh, San Francisco, so spanning uh, throughout the Americas as well. Initially, I trained as a carpenter, um, and I was doing refurbishing apartments, and I met an architect one evening in a restaurant. His name was Mikael Steen Jonsen, and for the architects in the room, you might want to look up a very famous Danish company called Van Kunsten, uh, that did a lot of social housing in the 70s. And um, I asked Steen to come and look at the apartments I was, uh, I was refurbishing, and he looked and he said, well, can you help me uh, build my summer house? And I helped him build his summer house, and we tore some of it down, we rebuilt a uh, new and year. And every evening we would sit around drinking Irish coffee and discussing architecture. And I was a young man, I didn't know anything about architecture at the time, but the dialogue and the fascination of being part of that creative process really just you know, blew my mind. So that's where I come from as an architect. Um, and this evening I, I wanted to talk a bit about connections. Specifically, I'm going to show, I've taken 10 projects uh, with me today. There's no chronology in them. Uh, um, there's difference, there's cultural, there's civic, there's uh, um, um, uh, 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 mixed use as well, and also some master plans. But there's a kind of a, a trend, and you'll see how projects and how conversations with designers start to inform other projects. I think when we talk about connections and specifically our connection to nature, I think all of us have a responsibility today in the built environment to respect the planet and make sure that what we do uh, is, is, is absolutely the best that we can uh, for both the environment and the people and also the creatures that we share this, this planet with. We specifically work a lot with knowledge sharing in our office, uh, and I'll get into that a bit later. But knowledge sharing really starts with a dialogue with other professions as a, and with people in the room. So really, I'm, I'm really, I really think at the basis of any good design is a very strong dialogue. And a dialogue also, it means that you're able to say no and you're able to say yes. And you know those boundaries and you know how to deal with that. In any, in, in, any given, in any given design. And then I think, talking about impact, I heard the other day, I think it was yesterday, that now we are 8 billion people on the planet, which means we have a huge impact on the planet as well. And as an architect, when you design, and design both building, but also as a master plan scale, that's where you really can have a huge impact on what you're doing. So this is a, a, a project from Copenhagen. This is a, 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 a headquarters we did many years ago. Uh, and you see here, uh, specifically, this whole headquarters is very open. It sits in the harbor of Copenhagen. The client wanted to fence it off and have it all for themselves. And we convinced them, you can't do that when you're in the harbor. The harbor is a space for everybody. They agreed. They opened it up. Now it is part of the fabric of the city of Copenhagen and a very important building uh, as such. Uh, as Enrique mentioned, uh, Henning Larsen uh, died in 2013. He started the practice in, uh, in 1959. He was quite old at the time. But really what, what Henning did was create a culture of curiosity. He wasn't a, a master architect that gave you a sketch and then you had to run with that. It was always the dialogue. It was always the continual discussion with others. So in our company, it's hard to define who is the actual author of any given project because there's so many authors in every given project. And we really rely on that. So when we go out 
and speak to the world, it's just as important that we give young people in our office voice and allow them to present their work as it is for me to stand up as a partner and present it on their behalf. And I think that is something we cultivate uh, and, 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 and heavily rely on. You could say we're a design collective in many ways. Henning Larson was known as the master of light. Uh, this is his first project uh, to the left. I have a pointer here. Uh, this, this is the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and this was really about how light defines and draws space and creates this, this really magical, poetical space. In the middle, you see a, a, an image from the uh, library in Malmo in Sweden. And here again, it's a different condition. It's a, very, it's, it's a lot of uh, Scandinavian light. But here was about the access to nature, uh, open, generous uh, uh, spaces. And on the right is the Glyptotheek, which is the museum in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Copenhagen. And again here, about how light draws space. But you know, we've evolved as a company as well. And, uh, and technology is helping us, and technology is, is impacting the design world in a, in a, in, in, in a pretty um, radical way. The image on the far left, that's an engineer in our company called ELF. And uh, this is a master plan we did in the Middle East, in Saudi Arabia, where we set out to get rid of the cars in the street. We placed the buildings very close to each other to create as much shade as possible. Uh, and to flush, and we situated the buildings so that the winds would flush the streets. And uh, we had done the analysis in the computer, and once the, uh, the, uh, the, the master plan was, was built, we went back uh, and measured, and we could actually see that we had lowered the temperature in the streets by 46 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's quite a bit, because if you go just outside of this development, on the streets of, of, of Riyadh, it is hot, like Dallas, it is really hot. <laughs> but here, people can walk outside, but they don't do that in the rest of Riyadh. So there's a kind of a change, and you can really impact how the, you know, people start to use the space. In the middle is a picture of the uh, uh, business school in Cincinnati. And uh, through discussions with our client, we learned that they were really plagued by student depression. So similar to a Tesla, which is speckled with thousands of sensors, we speckle the building with sensors. We cover the facial recognition. We can't see who the students are, but we can start to measure how students use the space and how they occupy the space. And more importantly, do they occupy the space alone or do they sit in groups? Because then you can go in afterwards and start to refurnish those spaces so you can start to nudge people and use spaces in a, in a specific way. Um, the building opened in 2019. We all know what happened the year after. So everything closed down. But the only building that didn't close down on the campus was this building. Because there's access to daylight, there's access to courtyards, and there was ample space where students could congregate and be safe together. Uh, so we continue to monitor the space and continue to have a discussion with the client on whether or not we are to go back and readjust uh, some of the, the setup. And this is a small project on the, on the far left. This is a, a school. It's uh, 7,000 square feet. It's built out of hay. And this is a byproduct uh, from, uh, from, uh, from uh, the uh, agricultural industry. There's a small company that makes these elements, and these elements are both structural and they are also insulating. So here, you know, this is the first test. Uh, this is a small school that didn't have a lot of money. This is actually the architects also building. Uh, I'm not going to tell our clients that, but we can also build. Uh, uh, and and so, so, so we are trying to always, you know, move ourselves as architects, use technology. We have a department, we have offices throughout the world. You, you mentioned that, Enrique, we have a, quite a big office. Of, uh, uh, in Copenhagen, we have a very big uh, sustainability department, which is both engineers and architects. Uh, and we're looking a lot at, initially, at the microclimate, you know, how do buildings perform? But today, we're looking much more at how do people perform in that space and how do buildings affect you as a person? Uh, so these are just some of the topics uh, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are constantly uh, uh, looking at and implementing in our projects. And we are also, let's see if it changes here. And we also publish. Uh, we publish books and we share our knowledge. 
uh, we, we, we create scripts that are open source, that are available uh, both for students and for other architects. And you can go on our website and download uh, both the plant to seed and the unboxing carbon. And they talk about materials and the carbon impact uh, that they have, uh, 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 the, 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 their carbon impact. Okay, so I wanted to start as far away from Dallas as I could imagine. <laughs> um, so I thought we might start in uh, Kiruna. Uh, Kiruna is a, uh, is a city which is uh, 90 miles inside the Arctic Circle in the northern part of uh, Sweden. You can see here the beautiful uh, uh, light that they have up there. It's a, it's a mining city. 90% of all iron ore uh, in the world comes from, or in, in Europe, uh, comes from, uh, from Kiruna. And the mining industry has <laughs> undermined the city. Uh, so the tunnels are going under the city. So they have to move the city center uh, 1.8 miles to the east. And we were commissioned uh, to, to create a new uh, civic hall or city hall, sorry, and a new museum and library that would be the centerpiece of the new development. So what we came up with was he heavily inspired by the iron ore industry. We basically s put all the offices of the city hall in a ring, in a donut, and then we took the museum and the library, all the conference spaces, the council hall, all the meeting spaces that could be publicly accessible, and put them into the middle of the building. So as you come outside, as you can see here, this is the first building uh, in, the, in the master plan. You see the ring of offices uh, that are encircling this iron ore. And as you move up and you get to the top of this, you get these beautiful views back to the landscape, uh, which is quite uh, unique. And here you have a section. So as you come in uh, to the building here, you come into the space, you're surrounded on either side here by, by people working in the city hall or here, people working here. And you can, as you start to transcend up through the space here, you go through past meeting spaces. The art gallery uh, is stacked above itself here. The council chamber is over here and the library is up here. So as you move up, you're, you're, you're going past, you're basically watching how democracy works. Uh, you're going through the art gallery and you, and, and you end up with this beautiful view but you're not actually part of this environment here, which is the people uh, working for the city. So this is an image as you, as you enter here, you see here all the balconies, all the offices that, that are surrounding. They have access from their offices uh, through bridges to some of the conferencing centers and some of the meeting spaces in the middle. Uh, but as a person from the public, you do not have access to the offices uh, that are surrounding. And as you move up, uh, through the structure, it's a uh, it, it, it's a brass plated uh, structure. It's uh, it's perforated, so it's acoustic at the same time, and it f reflects the light. So in a way, it has kind of a similarity back to that very first image I showed you, with the bouncing and the reflection of light, but also creating a a, a very good uh, and uh, and a comfortable acoustic environment uh, in that atrium. And as I said, it's the first development uh, or, or the first building in the development. Uh, the development will start to grow. Some of the, some of the houses, they are actually lifting up and moving. And some, of course, they are, they are rebuilding. But this city hall and, and, uh, and museum will be the centerpiece in the heart. And it's quite interesting because the city hall now becomes a place to gather, uh, not just a place of service for the community. Uh, so so it, we, we're looking forward to seeing how, that, uh, how this develops. Um, we've also done a city hall. This is our second building we've done uh, in, the, in the United States. This is a, it's not a city hall, but it's a public service center, uh, which means that it's all, it, it, it houses all the departments that work uh, for the city. They used to be in small offices throughout the city, uh, dispersed from each other no interaction whatsoever. Now they've all been uh, 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 consolidated uh, into one building. And at the base, in the first two levels, is a new service offering. So if you have any kind of interaction with the city, this is where you would go and do that. Um, so he's, see, for, for us, it was a very, it's a very confined uh, site. Uh, there was not a lot we can do with regards to the massing. 
We split basically the bar building into two. We lifted it up so there was a dialogue with the existing city hall. Uh, we, we, in our initial design, we pulled the plaza, which was in front of the building, all the way in to the building and tried to close off the streets. We weren't successful in that. And, uh, and then we created these apertures uh, that serve two purposes. They serve a purpose of connecting the departments with each other, but also they kind of act as eyes so that as a member of the public, you can look back into the building and see, or, or you could almost say democracy uh, on display. So uh, these are from, uh, I think we all know, uh, Minneapolis and some of the riots and, uh, and some of the uh, uh, protests that went on. Uh, on the left, you have the existing city hall. On the right, you have the government building. You can see that both of them are very closed, very solid objects. What we wanted to do was the exact opposite of that. We wanted to create something that was open, something that was transparent, something that changed during the, uh, the course of the day, so that at night you really get this, 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 this you, you could almost say look into the building uh, much more than you do on a facade that is absolutely closed uh, to, the, uh, to the right. You see here uh, on the bottom the, uh, the stone shield of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of Minneapolis that has been embedded uh, into the wall and the skywalk system that, oh, whoops, that connects to the whole skywalk system through the whole uh, city. The cutouts form the purpose that they actually are dispersed 360 degrees around all the floor plates so that from level 3 up to level 10, you can actually walk and connect all departments. Uh, so you do not have to take the elevator. You could actually walk if you wanted to and pass all, uh, all departments on the way. But this is really the first time that these departments have ever co-located. This is coming from many dispersed small offices to one organization. So these areas becoming very important gathering spaces, both from a working standpoint, but also from a social standpoint. And they act as a view out to the city. And as I said as well, a view from the city uh, into the uh, building as well. And speaking about outdoors, indoors, I think under the, or during the, the pandemic, a lot of us kind of realize the value of outdoor space. And we can see now that a lot of our projects are addressing this. There's a, a need and a desire to have uh, immediate access to outdoor spaces from the working environment. This is a project we've done in Lille. It's a project for, a, um, for the uh, Metropole uh, uh, Europlene, I'm sorry, my French is, uh, is terrible. It's a headquarters for, uh, for, uh, for, for the uh, um, medicinal department. Anyway, uh, but here it's really about access to outdoor spaces. These two people that are on the right, they are moving directly out from the office, out to a terrace. They are sitting in green, in plants, in trees. They really, it's really blurring the boundaries of what is inside and what is outside. And here you see uh, uh, the, the image from above, the building from above. It's, it's a 10-story it's a building. All the horizontal surfaces are heavily planted. We designed both the building and the landscape in this project. And you could say that in many ways the building is for people, but the landscape is for all the other birds, the, the, the insects, and all the creatures that we, that we share this planet with. They inhabit those spaces as well. So if you look and you experience this space, we've tried to, in our design of the landscape, make it uh, the exact opposite of a rational working environment where everything is linear, everything has its order, everything is in place. This is nature. It does exactly the opposite. It is supposed to invoke your emotions. Uh, it is supposed to, uh, this is a place where your senses come alive, you can look, you can feel, and you can smell this place in a whole different way than in that office environment. So when you go to this space, and this is on the top floor, on the roof terrace, this looks much more like being in a summer house or being in a farmhouse or something that is in no way uh, uh, applicable or 
like being in an office environment. So we see many more shifts in our projects now going towards working with the built environment and nature and combining and intertwining the two uh, uh, in a very radical way. This is a, you could say the landscape here is, is, is very wild. And what we've learned as well is that it does take a lot to actually maintain a landscape like this uh, and keep it in this wild kind of way. Um, but another, another project as well where we're working with nature is just on the outskirts of Copenhagen. This is a project called the uh, Common City. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a small development that will house 7,000 people. Um, and and it's, it, we've designed it in a way that it, the ambition is it for it to be all in timber, so to be the first full development in timber and with a relationship uh, to nature. What we've done is basically taken the notion of the city, and the city of Copenhagen is very different than the city of Dallas. It's a city of five, six, and seven stories. Uh, and we've broken that down. We've taken that and taken the notion of a village. And in a village, you kind of know everybody. You know your neighbors. You know your community in a very good way. So our idea for this is say, well, let's take the best of the city. We would have to create some buildings that actually provide us with density. Uh, and then we would have to form it in a way that we start to create uh, communities as well. So the idea is to create three islands, you can say. Each island uh, holds about 2,500 people. Uh, they are formed in a way that they really interact with nature. So you can see nature coming in uh, to all these pockets. Let me just take the pointer here. To all these pockets here, nature is really, really coming all the way into where you live. Each neighborhood or each community has its heart here. And as you can see, if you've ever been to Denmark, you know that the wind blows from the west a lot and all the time. So really thinking about how we place bigger structures and some buildings to kind of take that wind so it doesn't flow all the way through, which means that these pockets that you create over here become very beautiful, uh, not windswept, but very nice places that children can play, you can be outside, and it really creates a community. I think, I must admit, we probably overdid it with the green because there is a... Uh, uh, a subway, or not a subway, but a light rail structure running right out here. So it does look like it's in the middle of the countryside. Uh, I assure you it is not. Um, this is a picture inside of one of the units. You would be looking out. You see some of the, the towers of Copenhagen here in the, in the background. But you can imagine that living in a place like this, where your children are playing on the playground. Uh, in Denmark, we all ride our bikes. Uh, so you will be a, a barking lot down here, but this really is becomes a community where you have the sense of knowing everybody that lives here because you are all sharing uh, this space uh, in the middle. And for us, the, the question quickly becomes, well, how does that translate to North America? Uh, and we were fortunate uh, enough uh, last year to win a competition uh, for a site in Toronto. It was the site which was previously the, the uh, uh, Google Sidewalk Labs. Uh, it is this area here on the waterfront of Toronto. Um, Google walked away from the site and Waterfront Toronto or, uh, issued a new uh, RFP. We were on a team with a developer and uh, two other architects, uh, David Ajay and Addison Brooks out of London. And uh, we had a lot of discussions about how to create an area, and you can see downtown Toronto has had a massive growth, but how do you start to free up land in an area like this? And through our conversations with uh, Matthew Hickey from Two Row Architects and Indigenous Consultants, we started to discuss the learnings of building for seven generations and planning for seven generations and what that means and what the site had, be had been before, uh, going from an ice, laid, uh, ice age landscape, uh, discussing how the ravines fed in to uh, Lake Ontario and the importance they have for the city and for uh, the bird life and for animals in the city. But then 
moving on to this area is becoming a, firstly a trading post to an industrial city and today a city with some of the biggest growth uh, in North America. And actually I think there's another city that probably has had the same growth is Dallas. Uh, I believe you have 10,000 people moving here a month. The similar numbers for Toronto. So you can kind of see the kind of density you have to provide to, 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 to be able to accommodate so many people moving to a city. So our scheme was quite simple. We, um, we built six skyscrapers. Uh, five of them are standing up and one is lying down. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, we could create a, a building, a very long building here, which is, is a, a 900 feet, no, 300 meters long, 900 feet long, and it is 14 stories high. And that makes it this, uh, able to build this in mass timber. So we were quite excited about having the opportunity to build something that big in mass timber. What you don't see here on this image is that the building is perforated. In the, the, there are big cuts and openings. So in actual fact, it comprises of three different buildings that are tied together across, uh, across some streets. And in those areas, those bridges that tie together, we have placed communal functions, sports facilities, and so on. And the reason for that is that while you move on this street, this is the high street, we wanted to get people to flow in and out. Because behind this is a beautiful green garden. This is the area directly behind. So on the right, you have the building we've just been looking at. And these big portals that you see here are opening up, and you can come into this space. And what we did with the five towers was to minimize their footprint as much as possible, to free up as much green space as, as, a, a, as possible in this area. So this becomes an important east-west east link through the city on par with the east-west link you just saw before, which is your retail frontage. So you can choose, do you want to walk on the high street or do you want to walk through the garden uh, when you move uh, east-west? We've put a lot of effort into the programming of the space, how it works. There's a, there's a college here, there's a multi-generational care facility, uh, of course, workspace and work hub offerings and retail. So really, there's a lot of work being done of how to animate the space to keep it alive 24-7. Uh, and here a view from the top, you basically see that uh, the 300 or the 900 foot long building is one big urban farm on top, so accessible for all in that, 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 that live in the area. They can grow their vegetables and harvest them up here. The building is tapers off so we get sunlight and then you kind of see the big green garden here uh, in the middle that is again accessible uh, for all. And just to keep in the notion of very big buildings, uh, this is a project we have going in Sydney. I was born in Sydney, so this project means uh, quite a bit to me. Uh, we, we won this project, it was through a competition, and um, um, we won it because we were the only team that heavily departed from the notion of a tower and podium. We built a tower because the brief called for that, but then we totally dissolved the podium. And the reason for this was that behind the building, there's a very beautiful park called Darling Park that covers a highway that runs right behind the site. And we wanted to connect. So you're actually standing on a stair that connects the park to the building below, and then again down back in to the harbor front. So it's all this recognition of how these podiums really become, the scale of these spaces become very important to how we as people experience uh, these spaces, how we can interact with them, but also how we can bring nature uh, into these spaces. So the park extending onto the podium, the podium dissolving itself, and then just rising up uh, to become the tower at the end of the day. And the facade of the tower you can almost see is very much inspired by the rippling effect of water. If you ever see like water just rippling and a kind of the, the light reflecting of that, that's exactly what this tower is trying to do. It just shimmers in the light. But you see at the base, it's hard to define where the podium stops, where the podium star or, or, or starts. It's not one long facade, it's very many facades. We've worked with dissolving the rhythm, the tempo of the facade, the different heights, 
So this becomes another story, another layer of the city, uh, more so a village than a podium underneath uh, a tower with a direct link uh, from the waterfront and to the park uh, behind. Um, nature is important to people and especially important to the Swedes. Uh, they have uh, something they call Allamansratten. It means everybody is allowed to camp anywhere in Sweden. You cannot deny a person to put up their tent on your private property. Nature is for everybody in Sweden. Uh, we are building a, a, a brand and experience center for Volvo and Allemansratten is at the heart of Volvo. This is the, 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 your, you could say, the Swedish version of a Ford. This is about exploring, this is about access and freedom to nature. That is Volvo. So what we are creating here mm. is their brand experience center. This is where you will come to see the history of Volvo, learn about the history of Volvo. If you buy a Volvo, you can go here and get your Volvo and bring it back. Uh, and you see here, of course, uh, uh, the tie back uh, to nature. This is a small stream. The building, I must say, is in Gothenburg, so it is an urban site. And this is a small stream. But what you don't realize is that underneath this landscape is a parking lot. So this is, uh, this is the, uh, the build-up of the project. You can say we were standing right here, we were looking up at the landscape, but underneath the landscape are several layers of parking, and it, it basically creates this beautiful ramp. The, 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 the platforms and the exhibition platforms are then uh, carved out into the space. On top of that, uh, we create a, a mass, mass timber stool structure, you could say, with a ring structure that just sits on top of that, and then there's a beautiful roof landscape uh, on top of that. So as you approach the building, there is no real recognition that you're parking your car, going from the parking lot to the front door. All that is hidden. You are in the landscape, and you are going into Volvo. And here are some construction images uh, from the other day. These are huge blue lamb structures uh, that we've developed to, together with VHAG uh, from, from Austria. It's basically a a, a, a three-trunk system with a ring beam at the end, and all our vertical transportation is, oh, sorry, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Uh, all the vertical transportation is hidden within these trunks, so you would go into the trunk, come up into the different levels here, and you get this beautiful space in here that is much more reminiscent of nature than it is of car production. And I think that's kind of at the heart of how Volvo very much uh, see themselves. And on the top, we have created a roof that is much more like the northern part of Sweden. Uh, it's more barren, it's more like Kiruna, which I showed you earlier. It's an Arctic climate. And up there, we've created a small pavilion where you can go, and this is where you end your journey in this space, and then you can walk around on the roof in this beautiful landscape uh, up there and look back at Gothenburg. And keeping in, in landscapes, uh, I, we have a small office on the Faroe Islands. Uh, and not many people have offices on the Faroe Islands. Um, we have eight people in the office. Sometimes there are 12, which makes us probably the biggest office in the Faroe Islands as well. And, um, and a lot of people in our office, especially young architects, love to go and work in the Faroe office because it's an amazing experience. Uh, they go out, they go walking, they go hunting, they are part of nature. And we were commissioned to create a small uh, um, city hall in this town of Eistua. Maybe you can see it, but this is actually it. It's down here. Uh, and it's placed here because this is the, uh, where, the, where, the, where the river comes out into the sea. In the old days, the fishermen would meet here and decide what the decisions that need to be made for the city. So this was an important place uh, for them. So basically, we built the city hall as a link. It links uh, the small town of uh, Nordra Jutta with Sudra Jutta. Uh, and basically links that across the bridge. Again, it's a small project. 
It's built in the Faroese tradition. Uh, the old tradition from the Faroe Islands was that they would take driftwood that came onto the island and use that as cladding, and then they would put moss or, uh, or moss on top of the buildings for, for insulation. So that same notion, we've built the small uh, 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 city hall, and at the same time, it is an important link uh, to the city. When we visited the city for the first time, we realized that there were these two cities just next to each other, but no one ever walked there. And they had just invested in a new cycling path and a new pedestrian path, and nobody used them. So we built a bridge, and now everybody uses the path because they can go and have an experience on the bridge. So I think you can nudge people. There's a notion of, of what you do. And for the 11 council uh, people, we built a, a, a council chamber that is similar of sitting and fishing in ice. Uh, so, so you can sit around here. Uh, ah, sorry. You can sit around here and talk to each other. You can see the stream running through and into the sea. And of course, I think the, uh, the, um, the councillor said once, he is the most lucky person in the world because he can actually sit in his office and see the trout in the river at the same time. Um, in the same keeping in the neighborhood, uh, we built uh, in, during the last recession we had uh, the Harper Concert and Conference Hall. It's a, 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 a project that we won the Mies van der Rohe Prize for of architecture. We're very proud of that in 2013. Um, it's, it's an interesting story because uh, I think you all remember uh, Iceland went bankrupt at the time. So when we had built all the walls for the concert halls, there are three concert halls in this building, then first the developers went bankrupt, then the banks went bankrupt, and then the country went bankrupt. <laughs> and, 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 and of course, uh, um, you could either say, well, they could walk away uh, from this project and you would have these concrete walls as a permanent reminder of the recession. Luckily, uh, the government took on the project and, and uh, we were allowed to finish it. It's a collaboration with uh, Olafur Eliasson, who's an Icelandic Danish artist. So we collaborated on the facade uh, with him. And, and, and I think it, this, of course, is also a project that was won during a, or, or through a, a competition, a very big international competition. And I think we were the only people that turned our backs on nature and opened the building up to the city. And the reason for doing that is if you go to Reykjavik, you'll realize that nature is everywhere, in every single street. But they are really needing somewhere that they can be proud of, that they can go to congregate and be together. So this was this offering. You go to the concert hall and the conference center to be together uh, and to celebrate each other more than you have to celebrate nature because you do that on an everyday basis. The facade is very much inspired uh, by the light uh, in Iceland. Uh, in summer, of course, uh, the sun never sets, as you saw in the image, and in winter, it never comes up. So it has benefits, and I'm sorry, this picture tends to get stuck. So, But you can see the facade is basically a daylight harvesting machine. There isn't a lot of light in the long uh, winter months, in the, in the fall and the, and the spring, so getting as much daylight into this space as possible the benefit of, of, of Iceland as well is that it never becomes over uh, overly hot. So even if you have generous openings in the summer, you get a lot of daylight in, but you don't capture a lot of heat. And this space has really become a meeting place for people. This is where people go to hang out. They see shows. Uh, they have both conferences. They have, uh, 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 they have events. Uh, and of course, they also have shows here. It has become a huge economic driver for the city of Reykjavik, bringing in millions of people every single year, and only 300,000 people live in Reykjavik. So it really is a big, a, a, a big driver for their economy, but it's also a big gathering space. And as you start to kind of see and understand the space and, and go there several times, you'll see that people really use it. On the right you have, or on the left, sorry, an impromptu uh, a matinee concert. Uh, but if you follow them on Instagram, you will see that it's used from everything from yoga sessions to concerts to play sessions, uh, all sorts of events uh, that, that continuously are in this space 
And the space is really used as a kind of a celebration of people and togetherness. And for the final project, I wanted to show uh, this, this, this project. This is the Mosgard Museum. It's an anthropology and ethnology museum just outside of Aarhus. Aarhus is where I ended up going to architecture school because the professor, with the architect I was working for, he was a professor at Aarhus, and I asked him, which school is best, Copenhagen or Aarhus? <laughs> so I ended up going to Aarhus. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, a school and a wonderful city. And just outside, we had the opportunity to create a uh, museum. It's part of a, uh, a university museum, but it's also a part of a very beautiful Ice Age uh, landscape. Um, we like to say that this is the client, uh, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, the, it's the centerpiece of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the exhibition. It's the Graubeller man. He was uh, found in a, in a, in, in a swamp. And when you get close to him, it's really quite amazing to see the details uh, of this, of, of, of him. And he is, of course, embedded uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in the building. But another important feature was that every single year, thousands of people congregate and dress up as Vikings. They live there for weeks as Vikings. They fight as Vikings. They do everything Vikings did. And of course, if you could imagine that and put a big glass box there, it wouldn't feel right in the same way. So these were important drivers for us. So mm -hmm. our approach to this project was an approach of excavation. We basically dug down into the landscape and created almost kind of a, a, a dig out site. And then we planted a landscape on top of that. So what you see here is the roof. The roof is publicly accessible for all. People go there for a walk with their dog. They go to picnic. They go to roll down it. Uh, they ride their bike up it. But you don't have to pay to go on the roof. It's accessible for all. Uh, and you only pay when you go into the building itself. And what really has surprised us is the way it has really been used and, 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 and continues to be used. Of course, people go here for their picnics in the winter. It's basically the only hill in Denmark. Uh, <laughs> Every year they have performances uh, where they last year or now a couple of years ago they had a ship sailing down the roof, a Viking ship. Uh, so it really is a space and a place where people come. I used to go there with my children. Uh, we would hang out, we would play. We didn't necessarily go to the museum, but sometimes we did. My children now have a relationship to this place and they will probably bring their children to this place. So I think there's a generosity uh, in using space and giving space back, no matter if it's in the landscape or in a city. And I'd like to finally just end uh, with, this, uh, with this film, just showing how this building sits uh, in the landscape and how it's used uh, by people on an everyday basis. Uh, you can say we've kind of created almost like an excavation site, these small pockets uh, that allow daylight into the building, but also allow views out of the building. And you see here this beautiful space that is a, uh, we had to convince the client actually not to cut the grass in this space. Uh, that took some time. Um, and as you go into the building here, you start to see that there really is, uh, you kind of read the landscape as it hovers above you in this roof. And as you go down into the earth, everything becomes darker, everything is more intense and closed off, and of course this is the ticketed version or the ticketed part of the exhibition. And again, it sits in a landscape that is extremely beautiful, offering views back uh, to the area that before no one knew actually were there because they couldn't go up onto the roof, they would just be in the forest. So it really has started to become an essential part of that, uh, of that woodland area. And I'd just like to thank you by uh, ending on this picture. This is a picture of our opera in Copenhagen that we uh, 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 did a, a couple of years ago. Uh, it uh, again with a um, Olaf Eliasson did these beautiful lamps uh, you can see here in the middle and it's designed as this cherry box theater inside the space which opens up uh, to the uh, to the um, to the to the harbor and again just trying to get people to this space and this and every year or every second year they have events out here. They have a Red Bull diving 
event where people jump from here, from the top of the roof, into the harbor, and it's a massive experience. And now they are building a park next door as well. So thank you very much for coming out.